All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Uh, joining you from lovely sunny San Diego afternoon. And today I am joined by Mark Smith. You said you were in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, yeah. Las Vegas, which I'm sure is probably slightly hotter than here, but hey. Am I correct? It's okay. That's why we all have air conditioning. Exactly. And Mark's a 36-year veteran of the business world, uh, author of 13 published books, and best known as a guerrilla marketing guru. And uh, you, you worked on those guerrilla marketing books. I think you showed them a few minutes ago. You just want to show I them again did. Yeah, I wrote three books with Jay Conrad Levinson, Mr. Guerrilla Marketing. Let's just do a quick overview. Guerrilla trade show selling. This is essentially how do you run a 15-second funnel. This is the first book I wrote with Jay. So how do you capture their intention in a second and a half and get them to qualify in the remaining few seconds? Next book we wrote was Guerrilla Teleselling. How do you get the business when you can't be there in person? And this was really all about remote sales before remote sales was necessary. And then the Guerrilla Negotiating. And this book is not about how to get a better deal, although we do teach that. It's about how do you fight the dirty tricks that uh, – buyers play on sellers to get you to lower their margins. And so this is the antidote to the dirty tricks they play. Of course, I teach you the dirty tricks along the way. <laughs> it's still one of my favorite books. And I guarantee you, if you have not, if you have not trained your salespeople in the art of counter negotiating, you are probably leaving 25 to 30% of your margin on the table. So that is one way to instantly increase your profitability is just have some anti-negotiating tactics in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's a bunch of other books that I've written as well, all in the area yeah. of sales, marketing, executive uh, skills development. I know I was looking through uh, all the all the books and the articles and all the places Mark has contributed, and I was exhausted by the end of it. He's quite the yeah, prolific my job. output. My job is to make your head spin and your hand cramp from all the notes you've taken yeah. and walk away knowing exactly what to do next. Exactly. I love it. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is most people are familiar with the term guerrilla marketing, even if they may not be 100 percent, you know, au okay fait with what that actually means in practice. Yeah. But it, it's a term that's been around for a while now, as we know. 1982. So the yeah. So the question many people would have is like, okay, so what does guerrilla marketing look like in the 21st century? So mm -hmm. in 2020, what does it look like as opposed to what it used to look like? Or is it the same? Well, let's talk about why guerrilla marketing. Why did Jay use the word guerrilla mm -hmm. as in guerrilla warfare mm -hmm. uh, to describe marketing? And Jay came out of the big advertising agencies where his clients had massive budgets, multi-million dollar budgets they were using. And he wanted to help small businesses compete against these massive advertisers. And the way the guerrillas win wars, when your enemy has uh, fighter jets yeah. and bombs and smart uh, everything, and all you've got is sticks and rocks and sand, how do you win? Well, you do it using unconventional weapons and unconventional tactics. You never mm -hmm. face them directly. Instead, you do other things that they wouldn't even consider as a potential to go into battle. So guerrilla is still a, a valuable way of creating disruption in this world by doing things unconventionally. And fundamentally, if everybody else is doing it, don't. And if nobody else is doing it, do it. And that's how you create unique differentiation in the marketplace. Yeah, because one of the interesting things nowadays is you see a lot of companies, right? So uh, especially companies that go through funding rounds like startups, right? I mean, they're pretty innovative with their marketing to begin with. But the minute they get I completely VC disagree. funding... I completely okay, well, disagree. I think okay, their marketing their marketing is lame for the marks, most part. Yeah. They'll put millions of dollars into the product and they'll put thousands of dollars into the marketing. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. But, but, but carry on. Yeah, but let make me carry point. on. Make your point, yeah, John. I will. Make your I'm point. Gonna make my, I'm going to make my point. Hopefully, I'm going to retrieve this. Um, <laughs> no, but what I say is they may or may not be um, innovative and creative when they're small and scrappy. Yeah. Um, not all of them are. However, I'll tell you one thing. What does happen almost 100% of the time is the minute they get funding, they dump it all into AdWords and every other traditional, uh, you know, they do what everybody says you do. Oh, just go give Google all of your money. And guess what? If everybody keeps doing that, the AdWords bidding just keeps going up and of up course. and up and up the money. Yeah, everybody says, you know, we got to do SEO, we got to do Facebook. And, and the reality is most of these folks don't even consider how this works. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when you are bringing a new, innovative, disruptive product to market, which has been my area of expertise for the past 30 years, yeah. the thing is, is that the people don't know what to ask Google. They don't know what to ask Siri. So by using SEO and buying ser key search words, you're failing because people aren't using those words in the context right, exactly, of buying what you're willing to exactly. buy. And, and so the thing is, we have to use a completely different approach. Instead, of what we have to look at is what is their intent and what is what can we deliver to provide that intent? For example, Facebook advertising is unintentional advertising. People go to Facebook to get entertained. They're scrolling mm -hmm. through, looking for something to grab their attention and relieve them of boredom. All right? So that's a bad place to advertise unless you've got a lot of money and, and you can interrupt them you doing something crazy like a cat getting strangled or whatever. Yeah. And don't kill me for that. It's, I mean, just what, <laughs> that would stop people. OK, yeah. that will stop people just because they're going to be outraged by the cat getting strangled. And if we can then tie our point to that, then that might work versus, let's say, YouTube. When people go to YouTube, they're in learning mode. They're looking for answers. And so, for example, YouTube advertising is intentional. And you have to know the difference between unintentional advertising and intentional yeah. advertising. Gorillas always do intentional advertising so that we can grab their attention for a here is a potential solution to the problem you're seeking an answer to, even though you didn't know that solution existed. Yeah, and I think also to your point, uh, Mark, as well, if you if you go with the gorilla analogy, is gorillas don't lie in wait to ambush their opponents if their opponents never come down that road, right? But yet you see people constantly saying, "I need to be everywhere," so they start pumping money into advertising in places that their customers aren't or are never going to be or are never going to be in that mode to receive their message. Right on. I think one of the great examples of that is GoPro. Now, while they've had their challenges, they continue to survive, yet where GoPro launched was not going out and teach into the camera shops. What they mm -hmm. did is they went into surf shops and they yeah. went to ski shops and they went to motocross shops. And, and what they shop. did is they what they did is they showed people how to share their extraordinary experiences with their friends. Mm -hmm. wasn't about a camera. It was about sharing extraordinary experiences. Yeah. And that is guerrilla marketing. And in fact, uh, uh, my youngest son and one of those friends got one of the first GoPro cameras when they were doing the dew tour in Colorado. Yeah. And they hit some cameras around the mountain. And these two boys spotted the cameras, got the cameras, and of course told everybody about the That's guerrilla marketing. Yeah, my son was a competitive skateboarder when he was younger, and, and every kid skateboarder, all they wanted was a GoPro on their helmet. That's it. Um, and, and there's, and there's um, millions of hours of useless footage of kids skating around from point of view helmet cams that never went anywhere, but they all bought the cameras. They did. They, but th that, that's an example mm -hmm. of where we're doing guerrilla-style marketing, not SEO marketing, because people don't know what they're searching. Mm -hmm. So for most of us, what we need to do is target marketing. Who right. do we know that would benefit from what we're selling? Let's reach out and get them on board first. Because really the concept behind marketing is to trigger a conversation that's relevant with somebody who is willing to spend money to solve a problem with mm -hmm. us because we have a new way of doing it that they had not experienced before. That's great. So what are yeah. So what are some of the ways that, you know, companies can really like identify how to do that or where to go to do that? Because, again, I mean, I feel like, you know, the people tend to take a scattergun approach and are just shooting, hoping that they'll hit something. And, you know, that's a that's obviously a recipe to run out of money pretty fast. Really fast. Sure. But, yeah. So how, how can they how can they be more targeted in their approach? All right. So the first thing you have to do is find the the group of people that have the most blood spurting problem that you can solve. The blood spurting problem is something that's obvious. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed now, or there's going to be dire results. And if you can't identify a blood spurting problem for your product, you probably do not have a market. Right. And, and, and so you may want to do something completely different. Yet identifying that blood spurting product, if we go back to the GoPro situation, is how do I explore, how do I share this extraordinary thing I just did with my buddies? I mean, I can mm -hmm. tell the story, but the frames were way better. So that's a type of blood spurting problem those guys had that they needed to solve as quickly as possible. So, so we have to find that group of people that have a blood spurting problem. And if there's going to be a group of people where they don't need you, they're interested, but they don't need you. Yeah. And then they, they need you, but it's too late. Mm -hmm. 
So what you have to do is find those people that are in the middle, right in that middle where they've got that blood spreading problem, they got money, they can, they can pay you, and they're going to listen to what you have to say. And then you have to go tell them a story. And you have to tell them a story that they've never heard before about a solution that they had never imagined before. And the reason why is because a story can be told without sales resistance. If I say, hey, let me tell you all about my fantastic new product, people are going, whoop, shields up. Yeah, yeah, versus, yeah. hey, let me tell you about my friend who just discovered this most amazing camera that you can stick on your helmet, <laughs> right? And he was able to show me something I, I would have never, if he, if he had not shown me the video, I would not have believed him. Mm-hmm. And yeah. at buy him dinner. You know, so you tell the story, right? In a way yeah. that illustrates the outcome. And then with that, you ask them, so, you want one right but the thing is like a lot of people i mean and especially in sales everybody goes oh you know sales people are great storytellers but to be honest like there's a lot of people are not very good storytellers um or they don't or they lose it when they you know come to engage with somebody maybe they're a great storyteller when they're at the bar later or when they're in a relaxed environment, but suddenly when it comes to interacting with the potential customer, they get all kind as you say, they get all constrained by the product all, and the features. They get all weird. Yeah, get all weird. yeah they get all weird. So, so they, what's some so of the ways of overcoming that? Uh, you're not going to believe it. It's actually, you, you are not going to believe it. <laughs> Practice. <laughs> that's, that's, I have to say, I have to say, Mark, that is that's an absolutely outrageous thing for you to suggest. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just it's ridiculous. You know, let's let's be a professional here. Let's mm-hmm. rehearse. Let's write out a story. Let's rehearse it. Let's be able to tell it. It may take you an hour or two to be able to write it and tell it. And I tell you what, every every time you tell it, you're going to get better at it. And before long, within a couple of months, you're going to have a compelling story that's going to cause 80% of the people, if you're having a relevant conversation with the right people, to say, okay, so how do we do this? Yeah. But here's the thing, right? Here's, here's the thing, and this is something I've mentioned in a, in a ton of these interviews before, right? Though, as you say, being a professional about it, but I guarantee you, right? I guarantee you, most of us spend more time practicing our hobbies, spend more money on our hobbies than we do ever practicing the thing that puts bread on our table. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's true. We spend more time swearing at the, at the TV about our favorite sports team than we mm-hmm. do working on our presentation for our customers. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people believe that by winging it, we can be a success. Your, yeah. your clients, your, your customers can tell when you wing it. Trust yeah. me, they can tell. And it- and here's another thing I think people people underestimate too is that they think that I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. But as you know yourself, that if you don't practice the fundamentals, you can very quickly forget the fundamentals and you start doing things and you don't even know what you're doing anymore. And you think just because you've done it for a long time, you're doing it really well. But the fact is, if you haven't practiced it, if you haven't critiqued it or whatever, you, you could well be doing something completely wrong. Indeed, and most people are. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, salespeople tend to be egotistic, narcissistic, and uh, arrogant, and I resemble that remark. Yeah. And what that means is we believe that we know how to do it. Mm-hmm. The reality is that it is, a, it is a shifting pool. It's what worked 10 years ago doesn't work today. Most of the sales techniques people use today, including those you taught for decades, my friend, were invented in mm-hmm. the late 1800s. Yeah, they were, right, 1700s, and but that's okay. Well, even then, right, you know, <laughs> you know 1800s is when the professional sales presentation came together. I know, I know. Right, and the, um, John Patterson, uh, the original IT guy in National Cash Register, and the book of sales arguments. So it was the first codification that, mm-hmm. I, can, that I can discover. Yet the, the reality is today we can't sell that way. We have to use different methodologies to sell because our buyers are way more sophisticated. They have way shorter attention spans and they're not going to believe our bullshit. Mm-hmm. And so but, we... Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, but we still struggle with asking good questions and listening to the answers though. So, Indeed. I mean, that, that's still, you have to write better questions. Mm-hmm. And you have to have better responses to the answers. And you, have, you better make sure you're talking to the right people. 
Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it goes back to targeting what you're saying, talking to the right people, but also as as you men- mentioned, people of short attention spans and that. But that goes yeah. for unfortunately the seller, the sellers as well as the buyers, and the sellers are just as distracted. And you know, people love to go around nowadays saying like, I, oh, "I'm so busy, I'm busier than I've ever been in my life." And I and I always reply, "Is no, you're not. You're more distracted than you've ever been." That's in right. Life. You, you just you've just got exactly the same amount of work, pretty much. Um, you're just more distracted. But we've got to get back to, as you say, like targeting, finding the right person and then and then asking good questions, but, but really listening, like shut out the noise for a moment and focus. Yeah, well, and, and so let's just give our listener a quick tip on the best way to yep. listen. Take notes. Mm-hmm. Yet again, my favorite way to take notes is a Sharpie and a legal pad where's my legal pad where my illegal pad in that case yeah. these two together these are the this is it and the reason why is because when i take notes i want them to see what i write right right and the reason why is because if they see it they know i'm paying attention yeah. and they're going to make corrections if i make a mistake and they're going to act with more honesty because they know I'm taking a public record of their conversation. Mm-hmm. It's the easiest thing on the planet than snap a copy of the notes and send it. Yeah. And and you can and you can conclude your call or meeting with every, with by going, let me just go back over quickly what we talked about and let's make sure, you know, that I got it right. And you repeat that's it right. back to them. And that's the biggest, that's the that's the greatest respect you can give to somebody is the fact that you actually listened, took notes. Indeed. And valid and validated. Indeed, validated. So there's three things we must do as a sales professional at every call. That's to make our buyer uh, feel seen, safe, and soothed. Seen, and you, safe, safe, and soothed. And, soothed. and if you have not done those three, those three things, you did not have a successful sales call. You have to see them. You have to understand, even though they've, even though you've heard these same requests or demands or problems a hundred times this week, it's the first time they've told you. So you got to make sure they feel seen. That's why I take the notes, even if it's stuff I've heard a thousand times. All right, safe. Yeah. And the reason why is because today, buyers aren't making the best choice. They're making the safest choice. And the reason mm-hmm. why is because every purchase has political impact, whether it's business to consumer or business to business. Mm -hmm. It has political impact on your your spouse. It has political impact two or three levels up in the organization. And uh, let me tell you something, a lot of younger salespeople don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And and it, it causes severe limitations to their capacity to sell. And then, of course, soothed. You know, based on what you told me, I got you. We yeah. can take care of this. Or based on what you told me, I can't. Yet here is somebody who I think can solve your problem for you. Mm-hmm. They have yeah. to walk away soothed. Otherwise, you've made zero impact. So seen safe and soothed is the way to do it. And by the way, that also works with your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's Absolutely. the most amazing thing. If you want to, if you want to create a relationship really rapidly with people, go for the three S's, seen, soothed, and safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I love I love the way you outlined that there, and the way you're just saying also is you you need to make a, them feel like this is your only call of the week, not your 500. Because imagine, I mean, imagine going into your doctor, right? And the doctor comes through the door, and it's just like, oh my god, I've had a day, and I've like, you know, I've been talking to, you know, I've seen like 23 patients today, and now you left. Listen, you know, let's get into this. I mean, you you wouldn't be with that doctor for very long, would you? Because you no. Be, let me let me just go ahead and write your prescription. Yeah. All right, there yeah, you go. Get here out of go. here. Yeah. In fact, I'll leave a blank. You write in whatever you think. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, feel um, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a, so that's a, so that is great. Is you got to exactly, and I think that point, and I, and I often raise that one as well. And I think it's a great point is is understand that your buyer has things riding on this. Like it, it, purchasing decisions can be career enhancing. They can be career destroying. Absolutely. They, they're they're so much personally. So don't always see the buyer as somebody who's representing an organization. Remember, they're also representing their own career. They are. And that is always in their mind, whether they tell it to you or not, they usually don't. Exactly, exactly. And if, and as you said, if they don't feel safe and and they don't seem seen safe and and soothed, um, they're probably going to err on the side of caution and not buy. Count on it, because I wouldn't. (laughs) 
<laughs> and neither would you. Neither would I. All right, listen, Mark, this has been fantastic. Mark Smith, he of uh, Gorilla Marketing fame. Uh, all of Mark's information will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, Mark, anything else you want to add and let the people know about you? I'd be delighted to. You know, my area of expertise is bringing disruptive products to market. I work with executives of rapidly growing organizations because I am a business growth strategist. And if you would like to have a conversation about how to grow your business more rapidly with sales and customer acquisition being a big piece for most of the customers I work with, mm -hmm. let's have a conversation. I'll give anybody 20 minutes to have a conversation. And uh, I think that we can have a, a great time with that. Thank you for inviting me on Sales Pop, John. I appreciate yeah. it. And it's really great to meet you after all these years. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. And if you're lucky, Mark will even put it to music. Look, he's got his hand. <laughs> <on. laughs> yes, I'll grab a guitar and play you the entrepreneurial blues. So. And, and not just any guitar. He's going to just play a, a dual neck guitar. I got a double necker back up there. Yeah, yeah that's no, right. it's fantastic. So. Our, all right. Well, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thanks, Mark. Yeah.